Hello again, it's uh, Paul Beckwith and uh, of course Shackleton's here. Um, the other cats have all disappeared. Um, I'm talking, um, I, I want to kind of talk a little bit more about the, the um, costs of war. Okay, I've talked about the U.S. military report saying their, their actual ability to uh, perform operations could be severely degraded, threatened, even stopped, you know, in the next 20 years from abrupt climate change. But not only that, but the, the U.S. military use of fossil fuels is a tremendous uh, influence on ongoing climate change. You know, and it's one of these costs of war that is not really recognized that much by people. In fact, the carbon footprints of militaries around the world, of, uh, you know, the shipping industry, you know, and the airline industry have been pretty much excluded. They've been giving a fr given a free pass, you know, up until recently, but now they're getting more and more in the limelight. Nobody can get a, a free pass in our climate crisis. So I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to go through the actual reports, um, just highlighting some of the things that, that I've, uh, that, that are some of the key, key uh, take home uh, things that you want to know. So this is the cost of war, Pentagon fuel use, climate change and the cost of war. Um, and you can look up this document yourself. Just Google the title. And it's being talked about here in this article uh, here, how the U.S. military churns out more greenhouse gas emissions in entire countries, a September 13th article. And again, you can just find this. So in a, it talks about, it has some quotes here. So in a report out earlier this year, so that's this report, the costs of war, broke down where all that fuel is going that the U.S. military is burning. About 30% of the energy use goes to infrastructure, and the Department of Defense spent an estimated $3.5 in heating, cooling, and electricity costs in 2017 alone. The remaining 70% is operational, meaning the actual fighting and all the hardware it takes to support that, including fuel for tremendously fuel-inefficient vehicles, planes, and ships. The DOD is taking steps to green some of its bases, although that's less about carbon footprint and more about freeing these bases from relying on costly fuel convoys that are prone to attack, so supply lines. Gas electric hybrid battleships need less fuel and therefore fewer refueling stops, so they're strategically preferable. So going green with equipment is a good thing from a military standpoint, let alone environmental and climate. But even these reductions don't go far enough. So it, for 2017 alone, the U.S. military bought 269,230 barrels of oil a day and spent more than $8.6 billion on fuel for the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. And the military remains the single largest consumer of fossil fuels on the planet, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists. Okay, of course, it's the largest employer in the U.S., the Department of Defense, employs 2.15 million service members, 732,000 civilians at 4,800 defense sites in 160 countries on all seven continents. That makes it politically and practically difficult to reduce military activity. Less military activity means less military jobs. Okay, ironically, a great deal of military activity is dedicated to protecting American corporations' access to oil and other fossil fuels. You can just see this in Syria. You know, one day they're pulling out, the next day they're saying, well, we need to go and protect the oil sites, right? <laughs> like, uh, duh, you know. Anyway, there's no sign of this scaling back. There's no sign of the U.S. military Department of Defense scaling back its operations around the world. The U.S. military budget is expected to increase for the fifth year, likely reaching $733 billion in 2020. But even that masks its size, okay? Between the basic defense 
spending budget, defense-related activity spending, the budgets of veteran affairs and homeland security, contracts paid to private, private contractors, and the maintenance of the nuclear arsenal. It's actually more like a trillion dollars a year, which is a number I remember. So, in, so all in is a trillion dollars a year. Okay. Um, Okay, so the, the, it's, it's huge. There's, there's basically enormous and huge impacts. So the, here's the whole article, The Costs of War. Um, with an armed force of more than 2 million people, 11 nuclear aircraft carriers, the most advanced military aircraft, the U.S. is more than capable of projecting power anywhere in the globe and with Space Command into outer space. The U.S. has been continuously at war since late 2001. And the, the U.S. military and State Department are currently engaged in more than 80 countries in counter-terror operations. All of this requires energy. Remember this General David Petraeus? He said in 2011, energy is the lifeblood of our warfighting capabilities. You know, and they're talking about energy security, energy re resilience and conservation, but it's still the largest um, consumer. Um, and it goes on, it talks about the emissions, DOD emissions from all military operations from 2001 to 2017 are estimated to be about 766 million, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Okay, uh, you know, and it goes on about reducing the risks from climate change and stuff. Are there any figures? Uh, this is energy consumption, trillions of BTUs, British thermal units, um, and uh, 75 to 2017, so it, there's a decrease here. Uh, U.S. Department of Defense consumption and government, the total government consumption. Um, how much, go, where it's going, vehicles and equipment facilities, so jet fuel is a huge component diesel, gasoline, electricity, natural gas for facilities, U.S. civilian agencies, you know, is the small blue line, and Department of Defense is the darker blue line. Okay, and, uh, you know, you can go through and see all of the details. Installation, energy consumption by domain and mission, um, operational energy use, Northcom, CENTCOM, PacificCom, EU, EuropeanCom. Okay, so different regions of the world, how much energy is being used, uh, bombers, um, communications, tankers, fighters, fighters move, move fast. Put on the afterburner, you're just basically pumping fuel out the back and it's igniting in the stream of hot air coming out of the back, airlifts and so on, okay? And uh, jet fuel, diesel, total petroleum purchases. Okay, you get the picture from this. Okay, examples of mil U.S. military aircraft, jet fuel consumption, and CO2 emissions. So this is interesting. So the B-2 bomber uh, uses 4.28 gallons per mile. Range in nautical miles, 6,000. And the fuel capacity, okay, uh, so refueling tanker, 4.9 gallons per mile, fighters, tankers, etc. Okay, a lot of this stuff is, you know, who knows if those numbers are accurate. A lot of them are classified. Uh, let's just go down. Uh, zones of U.S. military command, so U.S. Northcom, Southcom, EUCon, all the different regions of the world. Okay, and the breakdown, these are U.S. military assets with climate-related vulnerabilities in the U.S. So, you know, it's not just on the coast, it's throughout defense assets with multiple climate-related vulnerabilities, whether it be extreme weather events, whether it be uh, torrential rains leading to flooding, whether it be droughts, whether it be rivers drying up, whether it be coastal storms, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, tax on NATO supply columns through Pakistan. 
Okay, so supply columns, large numbers of attacks on supply columns. They're supplying not only food and water to the troops, but also fuels to run the equipment. Okay, so if you had more energy efficient equipment, you would have not have to worry so much about uh, supplies. Calculating greenhouse gas emissions for U.S. military jet fuel consumption. Okay, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, global warming factors. They use 25 for CO2, that, which is incorrect. You know, <laughs> no surprise there. Lots of people reported incorrectly. Okay, so the other, so now let's go, no, just, you know, this is something again that, you know, I highly recommend that you read. The United States Army War College, this is the implications of climate change for the U.S. Army. So I've talked about the highlights and lowlights of this report, but you can actually download and have a look and read through the whole report. And it talks about the risk factors, weighing the risk. You know, there's lots of, there's images in here. Um, climate change, risk response matrices. And there's things like this, like climate change occurring. Yes, well, yes, but you know, no, if, what if it wasn't? And then mitigation and preparation. So you prepare and you don't. So if, if you, you don't prepare and it's happening, you get catastrophe. If you do prepare and it's happening badly, you can try to avoid catastrophe. If it's not occurring and you don't prepare, there's no change. And if you do prepare, you get you, you get uh, some economic uh, costs. So I don't know. I mean, there's you can have a look through. You know, there's some information on climate change. There's uh, you know decreased food security and food system stability, land surface water table. You know, as the sea rises, the fresh water the, the table rises. You get salt water intrusion, you can't grow crops near coastlines, things like that. I'm just gonna go through components of food security, availability, access, utilization, and stability. Okay, um, and let's go down. I talked about this matrix. These are, if the power grid goes out, what's affected? Well, everything's affected. Everything's linked to everything else. You basically, you're, you're sophisticated, uh, advanced country goes back to basically the Stone Age very, very quickly. Um, daily water consumption in gallons per person. This is if we're out in the field. So it talks about, you know, ways to remove water vapor, remove water from the air to supply water as you're moving along from place to place. That would save huge amounts of money for uh, these missions. Um, there's one more, infectious diseases and stuff, but I want to go down to the a couple things at the bottom here and, uh, you know, weather control. There we go. Right. They talk about the potential of doing it. Okay. So this is, uh, you know, well worth people having a look at. Um, and, uh, you know, here, here's the thing. This is one, I want to sort of end this with a couple things. So. There's this classic children's book. I don't remember reading this book, but it's called The Bear That Wasn't. So a bear awakes from hibernation. It exits its cave and it finds itself inside a huge factory that's been built over its forest home. Encountering a foreman, the bear is told to get back to work, to which the bear replies, I don't work here. I'm a bear. Incredulous, the foreman says, you're not a bear. You are just a silly man who needs a shave and wears a fur coat. <laughs> So aside from its entertainment value, it, this is a humorous example of a profound philosophical problem. When the facts do not match our strong theories for how the world works, we prefer to change the facts. How can we more quickly recognize the unexpected for what it really is? The foreman has a simple belief, no bears are in factories, right? If we have a theory of factories that says no bears are in factories, this is based on our experiences it's an inductive theory. Every observation to date has been of human workers. We couldn't arrive at such a theory independent of our accumulated experience. The more workers we see, the more certain we become. So we'll never see the bear, even though it's right there. Okay, and this is a, you know, there's fallacies in the way we think and in the way we believe things. And it's well worth, you know, reading these, these maxims about this and how do we break out of these patterns. Anyway, thanks for listening.